is nothing. Only warm, primordial blackness. Your conscious ferments in it. No larger than a single grain of malt. You don't have to do anything anymore. Ever. This is the moment that opens Disco Elysium. It's unsurprising that such an unconventional game has an equally unconventional opening moment. I've been around the block a few times and I can't remember the last time that my reptilian brain and human body got into an argument. Disco Elysium is a lot of things, but predictable isn't one of them. Throughout my nearly 32 hours with the game, I was thrown for loop after loop. I never quite knew what was coming next, and that unknown is what kept me going through all that time. Sitting down after the game to collect my thoughts, which if you look at the runtime, I had a few thoughts, I think it's a great game that I would recommend as a must play, for some people. <laughs> Before I go into my personal experience with Disco Elysium, I think it's important to break down exactly what Disco Elysium actually is, because the game isn't really easily put into a specific box. On the one hand, Disco Elysium is a standard old school RPG, sharing a lot of old CRPG tropes. There's an isometric camera, leveling system, stat boosts, and loads of people to have long branching conversations with. On the other hand, it shares maybe more similarities with adventure games. Much of your time will be spent using different items or conversations to gain access to different places or people. You might find yourself unable to progress because you don't have a certain item, though in this case most of these items tend to be information and not physical items. And while there is side content, the majority of the game will focus on the central campaign, certainly more than any other open world RPG I've played. It's for that reason that I think if you're going in looking for a Baldur's Gate-like experience, you're probably going to be disappointed. On the flip side, if you're avoiding this game because you fear D20s and math, you shouldn't be worried. The game is accessible to those who want to min-max certain stats and those who want to play the game more like an adventure game with some dice rolls. Regardless of how much you want to sink your teeth into the RPG aspects, you can't get around the abundance of conversation. You'll be doing a lot of talking. It's safe to say that I spent about 50% of my playthrough in conversations. If you're a Sorkin nerd, you're going to feel right at home. But if you're the kind of person that needs things to go boom more often than once every 10 hours or so, you're probably going to get bored. The amount of writing shouldn't be a surprise given the game's origins. The game was developed by ZA slash UM, which was founded by Estonian novelist Robert Kurvitz. Disco Elysium actually has its foundations in a book, specifically Sacred and Terrible Air, which was released by Kurvitz in 2013. I can't speak to the book's quality as it hasn't been translated into English, but I can say it was an objective financial failure, selling only about a thousand copies. This flung Kurvitz into sad boy hours, descending into a depressive alcoholic state for years after the release of the book. Pardon my pronunciation, but Kaur Kender, who helped Kurvitz on Terrible Air, helped lift his friend out of this slump. Well, Kender had alcohol issues as well, and they more or less helped each other out of this slump. It was during this point that they came to the idea of trying the world of Revachal in a video game format. Despite neither of them having experience in games, they believed that it would bring the world of Ravishal to a new audience. A team was put together and work began on Disco Elysium. The game was initially announced in 2017 as No Truce with the Furies. A version was shown off at PAX 2017 which heavily resembles the final version of the game. The biggest change was the name, but many of the core systems remained unchanged from this demo version. The name was never actually meant to be No Truce with the Furies, it was just a stand-in title, but at this stage in development the final name wasn't decided. Two years later, on October 17th, 2019, sporting its final name, the game was released to widespread critical and commercial success. About a year after the release of the base game, the final cut came out. This version of the game included voice acting for 99% of the game, something which elevates the game substantially. This version of the game also included some political side quests which were not in the original game, some new music, some new art, and other small changes. 
The Final Cut is really the definitive version of the game. There's no real reason to go back and play the original release, unless you just really hate voice acting. If the elevator pitch of a somewhat grounded detective RPG set in a western block analog sounds interesting to you, then I would just give this one a shot. If you still need a little bit more convincing, then allow me to tell you what makes Disco Elysium so special. But before we go into any of that, let me get a few disclaimers out of the way. The first is that I'm going to do my best to avoid spoilers. I will have a spoiler section for those who've played the game and want to hear all of my thoughts, but otherwise you'll be safe to watch this video even if you haven't played the game. The second is that this game deals with some pretty sensitive topics. These topics range from minorly uncomfortable to significantly more disturbing. All of this is done in very good taste, it never feels like it's outlandish or trying to be exploitative, but if you can't handle these topics then maybe you should give this game a pass. And the third thing, similar to the second one, is that this game has many different political thoughts and ideals. If you're the kind of person that squirms when politics are involved, then this definitely won't be a game for you. I'm actually not going to dive into these aspects, but the game is very politically charged across the board. It's good, but I can see a subset of players not wanting to hear about politics when they're trying to play a video game. If that's you, give this one a pass. The game starts with, well, we've already established, nothing. I guess it technically starts with a quick character creation process, but after that it's just an empty void of nothing but dark thoughts. But these thoughts aren't coming from nothing, they're coming from the main character. Yuri. He does have a name, but figuring it out is actually a part of the plot, so I'm not going to spoil that. And since I'm too lazy to censor his name out every time I use it, I'm just going to call him Andy Kopman. The game starts in his head, a dark void of Andy's inner thoughts. The complete garbled nonsense of a chronic substance abusing alcoholic. So it should come as no surprise that once the morning light pierces his eyes, he finds himself in a completely trashed room. Clothes are thrown everywhere, a bed is destroyed, and a stereo system is in greater disrepair. But none of these things are as ugly as the thing that he sees in the mirror, a grotesque amalgamation of the human form making an even more grotesque expression. At hour one, the man in the mirror is an enigma to both you and Andy, but by the end of the game you'll both know and understand him on a deeper level, likely a little bit more than you would like to. This is the one way that Disco Elysium sets itself apart from a lot of other RPGs. Andy is a very much decidedly not blank slate. He's a pretty established character, but he's not too established. He's more established than the Dragonborn, but less established than Solid Snake. Even though every player is given the same starting point, we will all end up with very different looking and acting Andes by the time the game's over. If you want to be a fascistic authoritarian Gestapo laying down the law with an iron fist, you can do that. If you want to be a drug-addled communist hippie cop who should have had his badge pulled years ago, you can do that too. For my playthrough, I decided to go for a real middle-of-the-ground approach. If my Andy took a political compass test, he would be straight up grilling, not getting in anybody's business or putting his nose where it doesn't belong. I didn't get politically involved during my playthrough at all, so those political side quests I didn't end up doing, and I did my best not to stick my nose too far into people's business. I took my policing seriously, but never to the point of going overboard on anything. I was lenient, but also fair in my approach to policing. Unlike some other games in the genre, I felt compelled to do the RP of the RPG. I actually roleplayed. I actually picked out how I was going to behave pretty early on in the game and played that role, something I rarely end up doing in modern RPGs at all. But mentally, choosing a role to play in this world is only the first step. From that point on, you need to build your character in the game. Besides picking your base stats at the front of the game, you build your character using using two primary means. The first is skills, and the second is thoughts. 
Skills is the more straightforward of these two systems, but it's a system that is very unique to this game. Some of these skills are easy to figure out and have clear direct advantages. Others seem about as useful as a peephole on a glass door. Something like Shivers seems like it would offer no advantage whatsoever, but it actually has plenty of uses. I mean, ask Jacob Geller, he pretty much did a whole video about it. Skills like Perception give an immediate advantage. Andy is going to increase the amount of things that he can see, smell, and hear. He's going to become more receptive to the things around him, which is actually a pretty useful skill to have if you're a police officer. Then there's harder to understand ones like authority. This will bring up dialogue options with people to more or less show that you're the one in charge. Alternatively, if you're very much not in charge, your authority skill will let you know that despite your best intentions, you are not on the true Sigma male grind set. How these skills actually play out is the unique part of them. Most people have an inner monologue, but Andy has an inner dialogue, or trialogue, or whatever Oxfordian word for a conversation with six people at one time is. Sometimes Andy's just interacting with one skill. Other times these skills interact with not just Andy, but each other. There are moments in this game where Andy will be arguing with a character, while Andy's skills are arguing amongst themselves, and your thoughts as a living, breathing human being is arguing with what's happening on the screen. By the end of the game, Andy's going to be hearing more voices than John Nash. To add further complexity, these skills can become a hindrance when you max them out. I maxed out authority and it was useful, but it could also lead Andy to getting overly defensive anytime he thought somebody might be potentially challenging his authority. I am a cop and you will respect my authority. Yeah, right. You better get back to school, little boy. Likewise, perception can go from noticing fine details to being stuck in a complete sensory overload. Others aren't as bad. Encyclopedia can go from offering useful contextual knowledge about the characters in the world around you to being that one guy who always has the most didn't ask trivia. As an example, did you know that in 1922, Walter Mueller of the Pirates hit a home run on the first ball of his first at bat? He was the very first MLB player in history to do that. I bet you never knew that fun fact, and I bet you didn't want to know either. If you max out Encyclopedia, you'll be hearing all that kind of stuff except about Ravishal. But that's not the only way that we can change these skills. The gear in Disco Elysium also has impacts on them as well. A silly hat might raise your drama skill, but lower your authority skill because nobody can take you seriously. But gearing up and skilling out is only a part of the equation. The other part is your thoughts. Andy has a thought cabinet. Every time you level up, you can either strengthen a skill or put another thought into the cabinet. Once in the cabinet, Andy will put the thought in the back of his mind for a certain amount of time while he processes it. Once he's done processing it, he'll generally have new options available. This is where Andy's ideas and ideals really come from. Character defining traits like political affiliation, feelings about himself and others, or past relationships all come from these thoughts. From a roleplay perspective, these thoughts are important to building the lore around your specific version of Andy. These thoughts have immediate effects on your skills. While the thoughts are being processed, they can increase or decrease your skills. In their final state, they can change skill caps, raise or lower certain skills, and other things of that nature. Much like another kind of thought, you never really know what these thoughts are going to do, and that's kind of half the fun. These thoughts don't come from nowhere either. They manifest themselves as part of actions that you take in the world. If you continue to bring up the plight of the working class at any opportunity, then eventually it'll dawn on you that the communism sounds pretty poggers. Or if you say enough gamer words about certain groups, you can embrace the path of racism or homophobia. The ideas are endless. Sometimes these thoughts are more bad than good, but it was never something that I found that frustrating or bothersome, mostly due to the fact that if you really hate a thought, you can remove it for one skill point. And yeah, I feel like a 2021 rapper at this point. I don't think I've said thought that many times in my entire life. The gameplay reason that these skills and thoughts are useful is for the skill checks. Just like in a tabletop RPG, you'll find certain places that you need to roll the dice and hope for the best. 
the odds of these choices are shown to you, so it's never a mystery as to how likely a certain outcome is. Likewise, it lets you know what skill the action is going to use, so you can buff that skill up to ensure the result that you want. Other things like tools can make certain jobs easier if you have the tool in your hand when you do the skill check. For the white checks, the stakes are very low. If you fail them, you can just retry them after leveling up the skill that it asks for. The red checks are the tough ones. These can't be repeated, so if you fail these, it's game over on that certain check. But I never found actually failing checks to be something terrible. In some games, if I don't get the outcome I want, I'll become a dirty save scumming goblin. But I don't think I ever save scummed in this game in my 30 or so hours. The game is very welcoming of you failing. In fact, it's pretty much the way forward sometimes. At no point in my 30 or so hours did I feel like I was given the short end of the stick because I failed a roll. I always felt like I was going the right direction, just taking a different path to get there. Worst case scenario, I would lose some morale or health, which are easy enough to restore. If they somehow happen to hit zero, then it is game over, but I was never in any real danger of that happening. These checks are all stored in your quest log as well, which makes it extremely handy to look at what you can and can't do. I kept notes the entire time I played the game because I knew I was going to make a video about it, but even if I didn't, the in-game journal would have helped me stay on track. It tracks if you've tried certain checks at certain parts of the map. It also tracks things like what you need to be doing next and for who, as well as if a quest is going to take a long time and be more convoluted than normal. The quest log never outright solves a problem for you, but it makes it so you're never fighting against the game for not giving you enough information, or fighting against yourself for having a bad sense of memory. Since I took a break for like a week or so in the middle of the campaign, it was actually very helpful to look at the log and get back up to speed with what I was doing in the game. And while I do love these systems and how they interact with each other, I do have a few gripes with the gameplay. The first could be my own playstyle holding me back, but I really wish there was some more combat. Maybe it was the way that I played, but I never really was put into physical encounters. I know that the game isn't supposed to be a big, bombastic, traditional combat-centric RPG, but I would have liked to see some more encounters. I did run into a racist who I beat up like a holy warrior of social justice, but otherwise the combat was extraordinarily few and far between. I'm a little disappointed by this because the combat in this game is really grounded and fucking brutal. If a dude takes a blow to the head, it's not going to do damage, it's going to knock him out or kill him. A headshot isn't going to increase your damage by three times for a critical hit, it's going to Kurt Cobain the dude. A gut shot with a 44 is isn't going to lead to some monologue, it's going to lead to the morgue. This more realistic depiction of violence does make the rarity more palatable. In this world, a drunk police officer with a Robocop kill count would be completely absurd in a bad way. Very similar to the real world, the violence on display here is typically swift, tragic, and final. Considering how tense the moments of violence made me feel, I think it would have been really interesting to see some more of it though. They could have included a few more combat encounters without completely destroying the narrative or realism of the world. One of the issues that comes up though is it could make the game way harder, as any armed combat in this game is decidedly lethal. Some more optional lethal encounters would have been interesting, and if they were to make a sequel it's something I'd like to see. And don't get it twisted, I don't want to play this game as the cop from fucking NARC or something, but I also think that more tense life or death moments would have been nice. Not every game needs combat, but I feel like it would have broken up the gameplay very nicely. My other complaint with the gameplay is the size of the world. I didn't expect the game to be the size of New York City, and it probably would have been a lot weaker if it were that big, but this map is really small. I kept expecting to unlock more areas, maybe travel with Kim to Jamrock, or any of the other named locations that continue to come up in conversation. This just isn't the case. 
As the whole game takes place in a very small handful of environments, the environments themselves are very fleshed out with a lot to notice and explore, but by hour 15 in the game you aren't really exploring anywhere new. And that's about the halfway point so it kind of drags the game down a little bit. I'd have to imagine that this limited scope is due to team size and due dates, but I'd rather have a more complex small map than a duller larger one if I'm being completely honest. It just leads the latter third of the game to feel a bit more repetitive as there's not that much new to look at. Another nitpick is the game has a fast travel system that's very poorly explained. I mean, it's not really explained at all. I didn't even know that it had one until I looked it up due to spending a long time running back and forth between the extremes of the map. You could likely ignore the fast travel system if you wanted to, but by late game I was using it a lot so understanding how it works is pretty crucial. But that's kind of it for my issues. My lack of glaring issues says a lot. I had to actually sit down and like think pretty hard about the parts of the gameplay that I didn't care for. Of the factors that I didn't like, you could probably wave most of them away as meaningless nitpicks or simply wanting the game to be something that it isn't. I still think that the gameplay is going to be polarizing. It's a very niche title, and for how much of the game is spent in conversation, I can see the game scaring a few people off. It's hard to sell the idea of a 20 minute conversation being a riveting piece of gameplay, but I assure you, if you're in the moment, it really is. If you can meet Disco Elysium at a halfway point and realize what it is trying to do and what it's not trying to do, I think that you can enjoy it. It's also worth noting that I played through the game on a controller for the most part. I was really surprised with how well the controls worked, but there are some sticking points. First is menu navigation. If you want to open up your menu and go to the map, you have to open the menu to the skills page first and then navigate to the map. I'm not really sure why the skills page is the default page in the menu, because it's probably the page I looked at the least. I was going in and out of these menus a lot, and I almost never needed to look at the skills screen, except for when I was leveling up. Every time I opened the menu, I needed to look at my quest log or my inventory, so why it defaults to the skills page is a little bit odd. This is even more confusing because there's unused buttons on the controller. They could have had a button that was just for the map and a button that was just for the inventory, but instead they didn't do that. It's a very small complaint, but it's a little bit confusing why the setup is the way it is. The other controller woe that you might run into is actually just having problems getting around in certain places. Sometimes you'll be trying to walk in a place that you just can't get to, a problem that you're not going to have if you're playing with a mouse because when you click it lets you know that you can't go there. The biggest problem is actually with stairs though, specifically these stairs. When I got to these stairs, which in the early game, you're going to be coming here quite a bit, I would just use the mouse because otherwise it's very finicky to try and go up and down them. None of these gripes made me give up on the controller entirely, and I pretty much adjusted to what it wanted me to do, so I'm pretty confident saying that if the only version you have access to is a console version, that the controller is not going to be a limiting factor in your enjoyment of the game. But the gameplay doesn't matter if the story, visuals, and sound don't pull their own weight, and luckily I can assure you, they do. I have to say that the writing is amongst the best I've seen in a game. I never wanted to skip past dialogue because I thought that it was boring or non-important. I found myself choosing options that I knew weren't important just to get a better idea of the world around me. I wanted to do side activities to see more characters and stories instead of to try and get some other kind of reward like loot in a normal game. Something that is completely alien to a player like me. I'm the dude smashing the skip button the second that a story gets even a little bit bland, and I was surprised that I never had any of these moments in Disco Elysium. Hell, I even liked it when Encyclopedia chimed in with those random pieces of exposition, something which would be annoying in a lesser written game. You know, this place must have been amazing before the collapse. Thousands of humans boarding the colony ships. Every piece of writing feels like it's further fleshing out the world. A world that's filled with intrigue and mystery. A world that feels like it spills out far beyond the scope of the game. And then there's the characters. Each character feels fully realized. A true individual that fits within the world instead of being just another NPC. 
Truth be told, I've played games with less fleshed out main characters, let alone their side characters. Some of the characters can come off as a little bit tropish, but that's more the exception and not the rule. This fantastic writing is elevated by the stellar vocal performances. Every character clearly had a lot of attention put into their roles, and everyone's VO is very well done. When the game launched, most of these voices were not here. Without them, I'm confident that I wouldn't have made it to the end. The script for the game is over a million words long. You won't hear all a million of those words on your first playthrough, but you're going to hear a lot of them, which means that the launch version of this game would have you reading a lot of them. There's a reason that at launch people were either lovingly or hatingly calling this the best game that they'll ever read. And considering my audience is 100% illiterate, none of you gamer guys or gamer girls would have even been able to appreciate the game on release. The standout performance, both due to the pure scope and fantastic execution, is Lenval Brown. He's Andy's inner monologue as well as the different voices of all the skills. He may as well be the official voice of Disco Elysium. His performance is so great that I can't really imagine the game without it. He just sounds so damn cool, I don't know how else to put it. On the corner of Voyager and Main, a large neon sign hangs on the side of a building. Video Revishol, 24 hours. It's raining and there is almost no traffic on the street. A woman's footprints in the mud lead away from the front door. He reminds me a little bit of Sam Elliott and the way that his voice just cuts through all the other sounds in the soundscape. Generally calm and collected while not lacking in emotion when it is needed. He has a voice that's super easy on the ears. He sounds like an NPR announcer if he wasn't freebasing his own farts and whispering into the microphone. For my blind viewers, well I guess they'd be listeners. This game is absolutely beautiful. I've never seen a game look quite like this before. A mix between sketches and paintings in an isometric environment. The world is carefully crafted like a painting, and the characters are a mix between expressionism and realism. The bombed out ruins of the city feel dingy and dirty. The yards look downtrodden with dead grass and mud. The lack of clarity in certain areas is just enough for Andy's inner monologue and your own imagination to fill in the gaps. There's also great moments with the lighting and the weather. It's a fantastic game and it has an art style that's more reminiscent of traditional art than it is of traditional video game graphics. Each character also gets their own portrait and I love all of these. Even without talking to these people, Andy's inner monologue paired with these portraits gives these NPCs a lot of character. Each of these skills get their own portrait, and while some of these are easy to figure out, some of them are so abstract it's hard to even tell what they were supposed to be. Even without knowing what the hell this thing is, I'm getting the feeling that it's supposed to convey. Pain. I'll go full English teacher about this kind of stuff in the spoiler section, but I love each of these portraits for their own special reasons and uniqueness. But, like the gameplay, I do have some minor issues with the presentation and the story. There's some minor nitpicks, like sometimes the VO is different than the text on the screen, or it's outright missing. Not ever enough to become a pattern, which makes it a little bit more jarring when it does happen. It's a super small nitpick, but it is something that I noticed. Another nitpick is likely down to more personal taste issues, and that's that I wasn't really crazy about the music. To be clear, this isn't because the music that's in the game is bad, rather I found the usage to be lacking. I swore that the soundtrack was only one song for a long time because it's repeated constantly when you're outside, especially in the early game. The song is far from ambient, with blasting horns opening the track which I found grating after a while. Love it or hate it, you're going to hear the song Instrument of Surrender a million times. None of the music is outright bad, and I actually liked the hotel theme and some of the more ambient songs, but the track usage could have used some more variety. It's almost like Final Fantasy 1 where you're going to hear the same battle theme enough times that you would swear it's the only song in the game. 
As far as the graphics go, the only issue is sometimes they stand in the way of the gameplay. The game has that painted look which I was talking about, but that means that sometimes it's hard to see certain items in the environment. This isn't just an issue with Disco Elysium, a lot of CRPGs had this problem where it's hard to tell what is and isn't interactable. But that's still a problem here. Luckily, it's never really a real issue because you have this detective mode like outline thing that you can easily flip on and off. I just wish that there was some kind of balance that the art could do that we wouldn't have to have something like this because I felt inclined to use it nearly constantly. Then again, my eyes are bad, so this could just be a me issue. Even with my small gripes, the entire audio visual presentation is fantastic. Despite the camera angle and decidedly unrealistic graphics, this is a world that I can envision myself in. Every aspect of the game works together to build an experience that's quite different from a lot of games. A heavily written, beautifully voiced, expertly drawn, and replayable world to get lost in for a couple dozen hours at a time. Okay, so I want to talk about some stuff that's going to be a little bit more in the spoiler zone now. I'm not going to spoil the end of the game explicitly in this video, but I am going to be talking around it. If you already know the game isn't for you, have already played the game, or just don't care about spoilers, you can stick around. Otherwise, you should skip to this timestamp. The game is best if you go in as blind as possible, so you've been warned. Alright, let's get into it. I love the writing in this game, but like the philosopher Hannes Montanus once said, nobody's perfect. This imperfection is seen mostly in the ending section of the game. So in vague terms, let's talk about the ending. Even though the buildup was fantastic, I did find the ending itself somewhat disappointing. It doesn't come out of nowhere per se, but it felt like the game just sort of ended. I also felt like there wasn't as much resolution as I really wanted there to be, and in some cases there was more resolution than I felt like the game needed to give me. There were things that I wanted to go do and people I wanted to go see after the big ending reveal, but you just can't do that. I specifically wanted to see one character about something in particular, but to go further besides that vague detail is to just kind of straight up spoil the ending. Another part of the ending that I really didn't like is how it just wraps up some of who Andy is. This stuff feels kind of rushed and could have probably just not been included. In the span of about an hour, the game spills the beans on your past traumatic relationship, life before being an officer, why you are the way that you are, and your old work buddies. It feels like you're kind of getting all of this dumped on you. All of this was so sudden that I figured leading up to the end of the game that this was going to be an issue. And I was actually pretty sure that they were going to leave some parts of Andy as a complete mystery, and in a certain way, I think they maybe should have. I figured they were going to hit on the past relationship thing because it is a consistent thread throughout the game, but after that, I would have been happy with them leaving some of Andy's background as more of a secret. Like, I'm glad we got all this information, but I'm just a little conflicted about it. Some of this is because the information itself I didn't find to be satisfying, and some of this is because of the way that it was delivered. Truth be told, I wasn't invested in Andy's past by the time the game started to wrap up. I wanted to know who the woman that broke our boy was, but that was about it. His amnesia, old workmates, old jobs, old lives, I didn't need any of that resolution. And considering the way that it was done, it probably would have been a little better if we didn't get that resolution. They could have left the door open to all that stuff, and I would have maybe liked this ending a little bit more. It probably doesn't help that all of this is seriously dumped on you at the end. The game locks you into about an hour and a half of conversations, and even though I love these conversations and I don't have an issue with them, it's just too much at one time. I get that they wanted to wrap all of this stuff up, but I feel like they could have done it in a better way. They could have like sprinkled some of these reveals throughout the game instead of throwing all of it at the very end. Another sticking point that people might have about the end is that you have no impact on it. Inevitability is a legitimate theme of the game and the narrative plays with the idea that things are set in stone and can't be changed. 
you could say that that goes a little bit at odds with how you can make your character whatever you want it to be but i think that this inevitability of the ending is somewhat of an artistic choice as far as development goes it's a smaller team i can't imagine them trying to spread out across multiple endings it would have made each ending probably a weaker experience while i have yet to go back through for a second playthrough i've been told that the main campaign plays out the same way every single time the killer doesn't change where they're at doesn't change how you get to there doesn't change who's the victim and their relationship doesn't change and honestly that's fine by me i can see how some people really wouldn't like this but it doesn't bother me at all but because of this lack of effect on the world it's why i've kind of referred to it closer to an adventure game than a traditional rpg but this game gives you a great illusion of choice and i never felt like i was being pushed along by an invisible hand to progress the game forward or in a certain way and there is still plenty of choice which does have an impact on the game your choices are never just going to impact the main story directly the best analogy that i can think of is that the game is a road trip with stops along the way how you get from stop to stop is more or less up to you but no matter how you drive you're always going to end up at certain stops with all of that out of the way let me go full english teacher reading too far into dumb shit mode i'm specifically going to go first year art student huffing his own farts mode on the character portraits as i said earlier these portraits can tell you pretty much everything about a character in just a quick glance Everard Claire is a complete slime ball without an honest bone in his body. His portrait is a sufficiently slimy creature, reminding me of a mix between Roz and Randall from Monsters, Inc. He looks more like a slug than a man, a spineless, grotesque representation of corrupt power. And you don't actually need to interact with him for all that long to realize that your initial thoughts from looking at this portrait are all correct. Tim's portrait is the exact opposite. He sits with stark features, a fully realized man set in stone in his role. He has an actual halo around him in his portrait. And while he's not a deity in any traditional sense, he is more or less the savior to Andy. Without Kim, Andy would be dead at the end of a bottle or at the end of a gun, be it his own or somebody else's. He's not a perfect man, but he really does represent a beam of light throughout an otherwise very dark and oppressive world. I really liked Kim because he's just a good man. He in many ways is Andy's polar opposite. There's a moment where the two are hanging out on a swing set. Andy slowly starts coming to a very terrible realization about something that he's done. Kim handles the situation, calmly trying to let Andy realize what he's done. Kim can come off as cold and calculating, but as the story goes on, it's clear he has a lot of love for Andy. Although, knowing Kim, he would try and brush off this love as just having him as a workmate or having pity for him, but it's clear that he very much cares for Andy. Other characters require a more artsy look at them. Egghead is a rave character who's obsessed with being the most hardcore. His portrait looks like a man who is succumbing to the most insane drug high of his entire life, with the lines between where his skull ends and the rave lights begin blurring. While to us it just sounds like music, to Egghead it's a truly mind-blowing experience, and his portrait shows this drug-enhanced moment of musical ecstasy perfectly. But my favorite portraits are Rosemary, Don't Call Abigail, and Idiot Doom Spiral. These three dudes are certified drunks. All they do all day and night is drink in the most rundown part of the city, which is saying quite a bit for a city that's mostly bombed out buildings. Each of their portraits has an interesting similarity to Egghead. The line between the background and themselves is blurred. Idiot Doom Spiral in particular has half of his face blending into the background, while the red backdrop of the background bleeds onto his jacket. Like many people in a situation like this, he's an invisible person. He blends in with the city that helped make him in the first place. He's as run down as the buildings and as torn up as the city streets. He's rubbed off on his surroundings as much as his surroundings are rubbing off on him. At a certain point, it's hard to tell where the bombed out alcoholic stops and the dilapidated war-torn buildings begin. He is a stark reminder of reality in Ravishal. A reality so uncomfortable and inescapable that his portrait is literally becoming one with the city itself. 
According to his story, he's a victim of this very same city, starting at the top of the life ladder and then dropping down to the lowest human existence has to offer. Regardless of the truth of his story about his relationship with the city, one thing is very clear. If he and his friends can't get their lives back in the right direction, they'll die in the very same streets that carved them becoming just as lifeless and desecrated as the buildings that they momentarily are calling home. Jesus Christ, that got dark and artsy. Let's start to wrap up this video before I get people popping antidepressants. For those not in the know, this video is a part of my Top 100 series, a series where I look at games which are often regarded as the very best that this medium has to offer. This game appears on quite a few of those lists and I was honestly very skeptical going in. Coming back out the other side, I think that it deserves to hang with some of the more popular entries on the list. Personal taste will have a heavier impact on your enjoyment of this game compared to others, but it's still very good. Some previous titles that I've done like Miss Pac-Man or Super Mario Brothers, have a somewhat universal appeal to the point where I think anyone that likes video games is going to like those games. I don't think that Disco Elysium has that kind of appeal. I mean, it's an immaculately created game with a deeply interesting world and a compelling personal story, but the gameplay itself is not going to have the same pull as a more universally loved game. This is not going to be a game for everybody. Furthermore, I'm not entirely sure who the best demographic is for this game. More so than any game I've talked about on this channel, I don't know if you personally are going to like this one. That's probably because I don't know you at all. But you do. So if you're the type of player that likes old school adventure games, has dabbled in some Baldur's Gate or Planescape, and likes a smaller, more compact experience, you're likely going to love this game. On the flip side, if you're somebody that needs a big world to explore, fun combat, and Michael Bay levels of explosive action, you're not going to make it past the first four hours. I hope that this video has helped you decide in some capacity if you are the kind of person that this game speaks to. Because if you are the kind of person that'll enjoy this game, I think you're really going to love it. It took a while to grow on me personally, but once I was in, I was hooked and it was all over. It will definitely go down as one of the better games that I've ever played. In my personal list, I think it fits pretty well at number 15. I have some issues with the game that range from nitpicky to more serious critiques, but none of them were ever really distracting or pulled me out of the experience. It's rare that I can play a game and not be pulled out of it by some boneheaded design decision. At no point did I think that some corporate suit put his tic-tac cock on the table to make the game what he wanted it to be. It's a very unique experience that wouldn't be made in a larger studio. It only exists as the result of a small and impassioned team gathered around a singular focus. You can feel the love, care, and attention that the game got. It has an almost crafted feel to it that larger experiences can lack. Lore drops feel like extra writing they didn't know where to put instead of rushed collectibles or something like that. Shopkeepers feel like real members of their cities instead of just NPCs housing a shop menu. At no point does this game feel like it was made by a committee, corporate board, or market researchers. Instead, it feels like it was crafted by talented artists, writers, musicians, and developers, because that's what it was. If you're still on the fence but have made it this far, first of all, thanks. Like, my writing is ass and my voice is grating, so I'll assume that you fell asleep at some point during this video. But if you're awake and hearing me, just get the game already, dude. It's available on pretty much everything at this point, and frequently has pretty routine discounts on PC. I can't speak to the console's stability, because I didn't play it there. Controls should be fine, as I mentioned earlier, but performance seems a little bit wobbly on some of these versions. The Switch version in particular seems to have some issues at the moment. It's pretty close to launch at this point though, so they might get patched out at a different time. And to think I was going to try and get this video out in time for that release for that sweet, sweet search term relevance. Yeah, that didn't work at all. The content between all the versions of the game is the exact same, so before you get the game on your console of choice, just be sure to check how it runs. Frame rate isn't super important in a game like this, but I can tell you that performance like this would make me quit before I even gave the game a shot. If you do give it a shot, give it a few hours to actually sink in. 
I didn't really get super engrossed into it until about the second in-game day. So if you're not hooked after day one, give it just a little bit more time. If it's your very first go in the game, I'm a little bit envious. That first playthrough really will stick with me for quite a while, and I hope you'll find it as engrossing as I did. But if this doesn't look like your cup of tea, I would say that you know better than I do. It's not hiding anything up its sleeve, so don't expect it to be something it's not. It doesn't turn into a big action shooting game with tons of loot at certain points. It's very much the same game all the way through. If you're in the latter group, hopefully the next game I will have will be a little bit more interesting to you than this one. But until that point, I'll see you guys in the next one. Hey, what's up, gamer guys and gamer girls? Uh, if you've made it here, that means that the normal video portion is over. This video was actually really hard for me to write as I wasn't sure how to really feel about the game for a lot of the time. It's also without a doubt the most dense game I've looked at so far. I mean, I've looked at some platformers and some arcade games which are dead simple, so this presented new challenges. Uh, for context, my notes document is about 20 pages long with a couple thousand words in and of itself. Uh, the document that I just read off for VO is like 7,500 words long. I've probably written and deleted more thoughts and observations about this game than I would have liked to do. I had some writer's block that kind of held me up too. I usually write a script and scrap the whole thing before writing a better one, and I did do that, but I did that here like four or five times, and considering they were all about this long, it was really, really time consuming. Hopefully it shows off and it was worth it. This isn't an apology or an oops, this video is a little bit late. It's just pulling back the curtain a little bit into my processes. I'm still learning how to do any of this stuff. I, I, I've never done anything like this, so it's a learning experience for me. I think I have some ways to make the process easier for when I take a look at a game this big again, but in the meantime, yeah, this video was kind of a nightmare. I plan on probably doing a shorter video for my next one, at least something that takes less time to produce than this. The worst part about all of this is that I still feel like I could probably talk about Disco Elysium more than I did here. Um, and maybe I will down the line when I'm better at writing, editing, and recording, but until that day, uh, you can consider my thoughts here as their own kind of final cut. Lastly, I wanted to thank you guys for the support on the Ultra Kill video. Without that video, this channel probably would be completely dead, and I never expected that video to blow up the way that it has. As of writing this video, that video is at like a thousand views, which is just surreal if I'm being completely honest. I know that my tagline is jokingly too many views, but I don't even know a thousand people in real life, so seeing the success like that is kind of surreal. It also gives me a target to try and beat someday, so I hope that I can have a video hit those kind of numbers at some point, but we'll see if I ever get there. A lot of subscribers and likes and comments came from there, and if that's where you came from, then thanks for sticking around. I hope you like some of what I say, I hope you like the videos that I put out. I put a lot of work into these things and I hope that it shows in the final project. That's enough for now, I'm done being sentimental for the moment. I hope I can get a few more videos out to you guys here soon, but in the meantime, you can follow my Twitter for dumb takes and stupid arguments. Like and subscribe to the channel so I can fire off some dopamine serotonin receptors in my brain. And until the next post, I'll catch you guys in the next one. That's right. Japanese.